Welcome back to the channel guys and welcome to part three of this Ansonia clock uh, service, dismantle service, clean oil. Uh, in the last episode we cleaned up the springs, we cleaned up all the parts in the ultrasonic cleaner and we discussed a few things about assembly. So now we're getting to that stage. This episode we will reef, we will lubricate the springs and we'll refit them into the, the spring clamps, the retainers, uh, in preparation for rebuilding the movement. We'll also do a bit of a, a test run of some of the cogs in between the plates just to make sure that all the pivots are good and it spins freely and there's no damage. We will have a look at the pivots on the actual little um, little arbors on all the gears as well. Uh, we'll just, there's a couple of ways we can check their condition and uh, we'll try and polish them. I don't have proper clock polishing equipment like pivot polishing equipment. But um, I think we can get away with some very, very fine um, wet and dry paper and just give them a bit of a, a shine up and make sure that there's less friction when they're spinning. So the first step is to lubricate these springs and uh, put them, we'll have to get our spring winder back out and we'll put them back in the clamps. Now to oil the main springs, I'm using oil as opposed to some people on the net that proclaim that uh, Teflon grease is the go. Uh, I've done a lot of reading, I've looked at a lot of videos, and uh, from what I can work out, they certainly never had Teflon grease back when they, you, back when they made these clocks. And uh, the ones that, the people that recommend a good clock oil, no one really seems to know what's in clock oils, and I wonder if it's just a marketing ploy by some of the companies, because some of the clock oils are extremely expensive. Uh, I probably didn't need to oil the outside there. Really, I just want to run around the inside. So I'm using a a engine oil, but it's a fully synthetic. Uh, this one is actually a 10W50, fully synthetic engine oil. And some of the reports I read about this uh, showed that it had really good, long-lasting ability to lubricate. It... Um, it did not affect the brass or any of the metals like some of your natural organic oils can. So uh, I'm convinced enough to say use a full synthetic oil and this one is slightly heavier grade for the main springs. So I'm going around the inside of the coils. When we wind it up, it will spread itself out on both sides and allow for a nice slippery contact. Uh, you don't want to over oil it with too much. We might have a little bit drip out when we wind it right up, but we can soak that up. Uh, I think you you don't want to have, you've got to find that balance. You don't want to have not enough oil because the dry springs will bind up pretty quickly. And you don't want to have too much oil because dripping out of the bottom is going to um, just make a mess. I mean, it's at the bottom part of the movement, so it shouldn't affect any of the pivots. But it's going to make a mess in the case. You don't want it overly oily. So I'm just using a cotton bud, as you can see, and wiping right around the inner coils. We should be able to get right to the centre. And really, I'm just a bit of trial and error, I guess. So I haven't done too many of these. So if I get a lot of excess oil dripping out, I'll know not to put as much in next time. Now we're not going to be able to get any into the in really small internal coils there. So I think we'll just use a very fine paintbrush and we can smear a bit in between every coil there and it should gravitate down. I might do it from the other side. I probably could have done the coils just with this brush actually. It's not a bad brush. So we'll spin it over. We don't need to get any more on the outer coils. I think just make sure that there's enough just in the inner ones. And that's it. So now we can wind that one up on the winder. But while I've got the brushes out, I'll lubricate the other spring. Let's try the brush here. And this spring is for the, the strike train. Yeah, I think the brush is better. We just need a really light film on the inside. I'm not putting it on too thickly. 
and I think that will distribute very nicely once we wind it up. Okay, I think that's ample and we haven't quite used a little cap full. So I think that's not too much, but we'll see how it goes when we wind it up. Now we need to refit the spring onto the great wheel and the spring arbor. So we'll just put a little bit of the same oil on the arbor where that little notch has to connect to the spring. And we can push this one back into position and hopefully it locks back on okay. Yep, it feels like it's locked well. When we wind it up, we'll wind it right up tight just to make sure that it has located in a positive manner. Okay, we might as well put the other great wheel on while we're going. Oh, now we need to make sure we're actually on the wrong right side of the spring. Aha, uh -huh, yeah, that's the click's not going to work that direction, so I've got to put it on the other side. So there's something to be aware of. I'll get that to come out somehow. There you go, that's clicked. Okay, so it's got to go in from this side. Uh, yeah, and I can see the way the notch works. It does only grab properly one direction. Should have been more aware of that. Yep, that grabs easily. All right. So now we'll put the other one on as well and get that one correct. Yep, that feels like it's caught nicely. Very good. Now that we've got them back together, we can take our little ties off. And let's get them wound up. Okay, I might get rid of these oily gloves. And we'll put our leather glove on. Just for a bit of finger protection in case the spring breaks or something. And let's wind away. I have to make sure that slot on the plate, there we go, lines up with that linkage. Beautiful. And I'll just keep the glove over uh, the middle. Okay, the middle... Um, thing I hadn't locked in properly yet. What are we doing? Are we winding the wrong way? Okay, we were winding the right way, but sometimes you get the middle hook part, because it's not spring steel in the middle, it's actually soft and can be bent easily. Sometimes in the process of cleaning and dismantling, it can straighten out a bit and it doesn't locate on the hook properly. So we have to physically just get in here and reshape it a little bit. I did read about this happening on other people's, and it's nice that it's happened here so that I can show you guys that, it, yes, it can happen to all of us. So it's not a major problem. We've just got to rebend the inner coil a little bit with some needle nose pliers. Okay, I think I've got it in a more favourable position. So let's see if we can get that. Arbor through there, and I think that might catch a bit better. Alright, let's reassemble here and see if we can wind it up again. Okay, hope you can see from that angle. Let's uh, wind this spring up now and fit the retaining clamp. That should be enough. I may have to oil this timber. It's kind of good that it takes some of the friction, it takes some of the pressure of the spring and stops the lever spinning out of control, but it's a little annoying. Let's put this bracket out there. Okay, should be able to fit our spring, our retainer. Very good. Now we'll make sure there's a little bit of a little bit of excess on this one end so we can line our loop up when we're assembling the clock 
that should be fine right we can now let the tension off and make sure the retainer stays central and it will hold the power of the spring there we go all the power is now contained and we can take our assembly out and there we go our main springs cleaned lubricated and back in the retainer and now ready to be reassemble let's do the other spring now i won't put you through that one you know how it goes back to this video now after a few distractions and a trip to the farm so we've got both our main springs lubricated and rewound back into the retainer clamps so they're ready to assemble before we start putting all the wheels back in uh, between the plates and assembling the movement we're going to first check the pivots on each of the wheels now that they're clean we can give them a bit of a check and i'll show you that in a minute uh, just have a bit of a glance over them to make sure there's no obvious damage then we're going to uh, temporarily assemble uh, one side of the clock movement so the time train and just give it a spin so we will assemble that but assemble it dry and just make sure that there's no binding and we can check all the pivot holes for any excessive wear i had a look over it when i first pulled the movement out but it, sometimes it's difficult to see where to a pivot hole when there's oil and gunk around it so we'll do a couple of temporary assemblies uh, both the time train and the strike train and just make sure everything's going to work smoothly before we assemble it properly so let's start with the time train wheels and we also have the the uh, main center uh, arbor and that's some sort of clutch i forget what they call this and this one's the hour tube so we don't need to really look well i guess we do actually that's where the hands go on so we don't need to worry about that part but this part here goes through the plate so as far as I can tell, using a thin fingernail is a good way of checking if there's excessive wear to the actual pinions. Um, and you will feel any uh, irregularities where it's worn excessively. Generally, from what I can understand, watching a lot of other videos and doing a bit of reading, it's unusual to get a lot of wear to the pivot pins because they're steel, whereas brass, where they go through the brass plate, brass is much softer so you're more likely to get wear through the plate through the pivot hole than the actual pivot uh, but yeah they feel pretty good i can't feel any ridges on them and this clock does demonstrate that it's it must have been well serviced and well maintained or never been used much because it doesn't appear to have a lot of wear so i'm just checking all these to make sure there's no bad grooves in them we will try and give them a bit of a polish before we assemble them um, but I think we'll put them in the plates first and just make sure that there's no uh, excess friction from anywhere, such as a, a damaged tooth or um, a little bent pin on the actual pinion gear there. So, so they certainly feel okay. And just the this little piece, the pellet, I think it's called. Can't see any excessive wear there. Uh, so that's the time train. We'll do the same with the strike train. Uh, and then we'll partially assemble one and the other and see how they look. So we'll start with the strike train. And I'm not going to put the spring over the post to anchor it. I just want to put the uh, great wheel into the frame where it goes into the plate. And it goes that way, actually. And because our click's not engaged, we can move the great wheel independently of the spring. So now we can put the other wheels in. And without looking back at my footage or photos, I'll see if I can work it out. That one goes.
goes there. So every large wheel interacts with a pinion, which is the smaller one. And wheels generally get smaller as you go. I think that's probably applicable to the time train. Perhaps not in the strike train, I'm not too sure. So that one must go up that way. We don't have to worry about any sort of timing or anything at this stage. I just want to assemble the the wheel train so that everything interacts how it's supposed to. Oh, we have another wheel here. So is that one next? Have I got those in the right order? I think that one goes under there. And the fly goes at the end here. So there we go. They're all assembled. Now we need to put the top plate on and line all the pivots up, which can be pretty fiddly, and it's certainly going to be much more fiddly when we're doing the whole lot at once. Doing half at once should be much more achievable. So start down the bottom here, get the main arbor, winding arbor through, and we should be able to work our way along, dropping the pivots in their holes. Uh, and they do recommend, I think, putting nuts on the posts so that it can't slip off, and just doing them up so that it kind of maintains the plate and stops it lifting and things dropping out that you've already got in. So we'll put a bit of fresh pressure on the front here. We'll get a bit of vision on the side. And we've just got to work each pivot in one at a time. One at the back here. A little tricky doing this with the camera in my in the road There we go, dropped in. So that wasn't so bad. I didn't, I tried not to edit that. I didn't speed it up just so you know the exact time it takes. You do have to be patient. It's going to be a lot longer to do the whole thing when we're putting it all together properly. Um, and I might leave that run in normal time so that you've got an idea. You may hear me cursing a little bit as we go, but I think I'll leave it run as a longer video and then you do get an exact idea of how long it takes to do it. All the clock videos I've seen either had guys cut bits out, edit it severely so that you sort of saw them struggling and then suddenly it's like, there, I've done it. Or they've sped it up at such a fast speed that you can't really see what's going on. So now that we've got that assembled, we can turn the wheels and make sure that there's no excessive friction anywhere. Is everything lined up? There we go. We should be able to get it to run from the great wheel. Remember, it's not lubricated. Seems a little stiff, but I think it's all right. I can't feel any damage on any of the gears. So the important thing to check now is the pivots, when we rock them back and forward, 
if there's a badly worn pivot hole, you will see the shaft rock back and forward because it wears the holes in an oval manner. And you can see, let's see if we can zoom in a little bit here. Hopefully you're not getting reflection. So that pivot hole there, I think that's okay now. If you see that, you can see the actual pivot rocking back and forward a little bit in the hole. So it's certainly worn, but I don't think that's bad enough to rebush. All the others look okay. Let's look at the other side. Yeah, a little bit of movement in that pivot there as well, but I'm sure that's okay. Can't see any wear that actually needs to be rebushed. The other thing we've got to check is uh, end float or end shake, and we should have up and down movement on each of the arbors by around about a millimeter or so. You wouldn't want any more, but you certainly don't want them to bind. And they're all working fine. There's plenty of end float on all of those. And the plates are, or well, the nuts aren't super tight, but the plates are together properly. So I'm satisfied that all the stripe train is okay. There's nothing that needs rebushing. Uh, all the teeth appear to be okay because I can't feel it actually binding. It takes a bit of pressure to drive it. But that seems to be working quite well. Okay, we'll pull that side apart and we'll do the same with the time side. So now I have the time train all together and it went together pretty well. It's not hard to work out where the wheels go. Uh, usually, well, there is only one position where they'll work properly, so sometimes if you're not sure, just try different wheels until it works. So that all looks good, and we have good movement with pressure on the great wheel. It's driving the whole lot nicely. And to check the pivot holes again, there is certainly some wear to that, but I, again, I don't think it's bad enough to rebush. And we'll rock it back and forward. Yeah, there's not too bad a wear there. A little bit, but not too bad at all. And this side, yeah, that looks good. Can't see any issues there. Now we just need to check the end float on these ones. Make sure they've all got some movement up and down. They'll click up and down nicely with good movement. So that's fine. So, all right, we don't need to do any repair work to this movement. So let's dismantle all the wheels again, remove the plate. And the last thing I want to do in this episode is we'll look at just giving the pivots a bit of a polish, even though we didn't find any bad wear to them. Uh, if we can give them a polish, get them nice and shiny, there's less friction than in every moving part, and friction is the enemy of the clock. The more friction we can reduce, the better the clock's going to run. And that's why we were checking the end float of the shafts, because if one arbor is jammed between the plates and the end shoulders are rubbing and it's too tight, there's massive amounts of friction there and it will stop the clock for sure. Uh, I don't know how that can actually happen really unless there's a lot of build up on one end or for some reason the plate has been bent and it's not um, hasn't got the right clearance between the plates. But uh, if we can polish the pivots, we will reduce friction to a bare minimum and then we'll have to clean all the parts again. So there's lots of processes in doing the service properly. But I'm actually, I've got to say, I'm not 100% happy with the cleaning product I used in the ultrasonic cleaner. Uh, some of the parts still look quite grubby. There's no obvious oil or dried uh, muck left on them, so it's cleaned them off okay, but some parts still don't look very clean. So I might have to investigate another cleaner for the ultrasonic cleaner, a detergent. If you know of any good uh, products, 
leave them in the comments. I'd be interested in trying some, but the one I did use, yeah, the water certainly went dirty, but these parts still don't look as clean as I think they probably should be. Now, the final job in this video episode is to polish the pivots, and I've got my poor man's lathe out here. It's just a Dremel in a vise here. It's not mounted super tightly because it doesn't need to, but it's just secure. The, um, the pivots fit nicely into the little chuck of the Dremel, and again, they don't need to be super tight. We don't want to bend anything, uh, but it allows it to spin, and it's a variable speed one, this one, so we can spin it at low, temp uh, low revolutions. And what I'm using is some 3000 grit paper, which is virtually, virtually smooth. It's so fine because we don't want to take material or very much material off these pivots. I'll turn that off for a minute. Uh, what we need to do is just polish them so there's absolutely minimal friction when it's back in the pivot hole. So I've already done this one. And you can see, if we get a focus, the pivots are actually quite shiny. And remember that these ones aren't very worn. They seem to be in fairly good condition anyway. So this 3000 grid is just going to shine them up, just going to polish them, reduce their friction. And uh, we'll go through all the wheels and do that. Then we'll need to run them all through the cleaner again. So with all the pivots polished and everything inspected, it leaves us pretty well ready to assemble after a further clean of all the parts. I won't obviously have to do the main springs again because they've been oiled and ready to go. I might put the plates back through the cleaner, given that they still look a little grubby. So I'll clean all those and I'll catch you in the next episode where we'll delve into the assembly and hopefully it goes together well. Thanks for watching guys. Catch you in the next one. Bye for now.